Professor Andrew Fracknoy. When it comes to astronomy, he is a great rep for the cosmos. He's the emeritus chair at the astronomy department at Foothill College. Hello, Professor Fracknoy. How are you, sir? Good. Nice to be back with you, Mark. I am uh, uh, grateful, and you obviously can tell that you're here on a day that's kind of a big deal to us. We've been on this new platform, having left KGO for a year, and so wow. that's why there's a lot of uh, pomp and circumstance. But there is some cosmic, or uh, I don't know if that's the way it should be referred to, astronomical pomp and circumstance this week, which is why we really wanted to have you on. I wonder if you could just give us a sense of that. Right. Well, to celebrate your anniversary, <laughs> uh, the solar system has scheduled on Saturday, an eclipse of the sun uh, wow. in all of North America. So uh, this is our way of paying tribute to your answer. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, uh, we are uh, actually going to have an eclipse of the sun. Uh, it's the kind of eclipse where the sun never completely goes out anywhere. There's always a ring of the sun visible behind the dark disk of the moon. But Everywhere in North America, people will be able to see some part of the sun eclipsed. And here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, almost 80% of the sun will be covered uh, by the dark disk of the moon. So it's an opportunity to see the motions and complexities of the solar system uh, in the sky near you. Now, will it sounds to me like no one in... California, certainly, but will there be any place in the U.S. where you could actually see more than 85 percent yes. coverage? Well, you have a map up, and that's great. I'm going to talk right about that. So on that red path, the path enclosed by red lines on the map we're seeing, um, you can see that there is a path when the, the ring of fire, what's called the annular eclipse, uh, is visible. And it starts in Eugene, Oregon and then go southeastward through Albuquerque, New Mexico, and leaves the United States in southeast Texas, goes into the Gulf of Mexico. So if you're within that 100-mile path, you will see the moon exactly in front of the sun and just a little ring of the sun showing. Everywhere else in North America, the further you are from that, um, oh, there we see the ring. Um, and the further you are from that path, the less of the sun will be covered. And in San Francisco, we're doing pretty well with about 80% of the sun's surface covered by the moon. Is that what it will look like, Professor? That's the red, the, the picture we're seeing now is the ring. Uh, so that's what it'll look like in Eugene, Oregon, and on that path about 100 miles wide uh, with a ring of the sun showing. Uh, everywhere else, it'll look like just a big black bite is taken out of the sun, but that's intriguing too. Oh my God, yes, that's really, in fact, I have to say that when I was first reading about this, I thought, because if you, you know, and you've talked about this, the, the power of the sun, you know, it's so incredibly powerful that even if a little bit's exposed, you don't really notice, it's not gonna get dark, you know what I mean? Uh, because a little bit is enough to illuminate. It's got that kind of power. But now you're saying, but if you actually, and I want to get to this because you actually are part of a group that has uh, distributed and has funded special glasses where you can look at, at the eclipse. If you're looking, you'll see that, that we're kind of seeing on screen. Right, Professor? Right. Well, so this is this is actually showing you uh, the ring of fire eclipse. But right. we will we will see more of a, uh, a bite. The sun, yeah. the whole sun showing and then a big bite taken out of it. But yes, whenever any part of the sun is showing, as you say, it's dangerous to look at the sun. Even that little ring of the sun showing around the moon is enough if you look at it for a long time to damage your eyes. So we, I hope we will talk about various ways that people can protect their eyes. There, ah, there we have a picture of the bite taken out of the sun during a partial eclipse. Perfect. So yeah. you are part of this uh, Moore Foundation and you're one of the leaders of this project. Right. Um, to distribute 5 million safe viewing glasses and information through 10,000 public libraries nationwide. And, and there are a lot of libraries in the Bay Area, which is where you are, that are participating, is what I'm told. That, that's correct. So the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation have very kindly funded a project to distribute glasses and information about the eclipse through public libraries nationwide. Now, 
Uh, this close to the eclipse, many of the libraries have run out of glasses, but please check politely with a library near you. <laughs> Have there been a lot of that. impolite requests, Professor? Yes, there have been. <laughs> when the libraries run out, people yell at the librarian. Oh, we, we astronomers have been told, please remind the listeners that the librarians are doing their best. And if they run out, <laughs> it's because Mark Thompson talked about it and there aren't <laughs> any left. Yeah, oh my God, that's so, great. Anyway, uh, but let me just finish that thought. So please. everybody needs to have protection in order to look at the sun, even during an eclipse. So if you can score one of these glasses, that's great. But if not, there are still other ways to look at the sun. And my favorite is to use a colander. What? A yeah. colander? Now, what? you know what I mean by colander, one of those things you wash vegetables in with a lot of Yeah, they with the little holes, you strain stuff. They or? serve as a pinhole projector. So here's what you do. It's very simple. You stand with your back to the sun Saturday morning. You hold the colander over your shoulder so that you're not looking at the sun. The, the sunlight is streaming through the colander, the holes in the colander, and you make a shadow on the sidewalk. And that shadow, each hole in the colander, will show you an eclipse sun. Will show you oh, the light on the sun. Cool. <laughs> Colander acts like a little pinhole projector for each of its holes. And if you're standing on the street with a colander over your shoulder, chances are the neighbors are going to come over and see if you're okay. And then you can tell them all about the eclipse. That's very, very cool. I like that uh, we all probably have what we need to uh, to see it. Nick says, I went to Oregon for the first total eclipse in 2017. Very cool experience. That's a total eclipse. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if you can speak to that because there is an opportunity to see a total eclipse that's coming up next year. Right. So uh, incredibly unusual for the same country to get two eclipses this close. But in addition to this eclipse that we're talking about Saturday, October 14th, there will be another North American eclipse on April 8th of next year. On a Monday, April 8th, there will be a total eclipse of the sun visible in the United States. And most of the country, again, will see a partial eclipse, but on a line uh, starting out in Texas and then going northeastward through some of the Midwestern states and then into upstate New York and New England. If you're on that path where the eclipse is total, you'll see the spectacular total eclipse that we were talking about. The again, weather is so key in that situation. You know, we yeah. we traveled to Kansas City. Oh, there's the colander. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's really great. Thank you, Kim. Or on the Tony. left, you see the colander, and on the right, you see the same effect through the branches and leaves of a tree. If you stand under a tree, which has a lot of crisscrossing branches, then the holes in the branches also act like pinhole projectors and show you in the shadow of the tree lots and lots of eclipse sun. So both of those, using a tree as a pinhole projector or a colander, will work without hurting your eyes. I just love it. Let me ask you one uh, quick question, but, but thank you again for taking time out to, to be with us. I just think you're a great authority on this. Astronomy is one of those sciences that is, it seems to me, and I guess this is what I'm asking you, was one of the earliest sciences developed in as civilization evolved. Is that right? I think that's very right. I mean, people began to notice long before writing uh, that there were regularities in the sky. First of all, they were just impressed by the night sky. Before there were city lights, people had much better access to the beauty of the night sky. And then people noticed regularities. The moon went through a regular set of changes month after month. Uh, the sun's altitude in the sky changed. And sometimes there were long days and short nights. And sometimes there were short days and long nights. So people began to pay attention to the sky. Some groups actually worshipped the objects in the sky. And it was one of the first ways that humanity began to organize its knowledge and get some grip on the natural world. And it's just so interesting to look back and see how astronomers and scientists had to swim upstream against religiosity and other belief and just basic denying. How could you, you know, we get a little bit of it today, maybe more than a little bit. <laughs> right, well, there is. I mean, there's still people going around saying the Earth is flat and that NASA never went to the moon and that 
the the position of the sun on the day you were born determines your love life and destiny i mean ufos are coming here and kidnapping uh farmers in the in in rural states i mean all of this is i think in part because it is so interesting to think about what's out there and uh, uh, people have a natural interest. Many kids say that the most interesting thing to them is outer space and dinosaurs. Those are the two subjects that kids are naturally interested in. And many of us keep that interest throughout our lives. It's a wondrous thing, the cosmos. And so many sci-fi projects have been based around it and so many franchises so successful <laughs> even though they just kind of take place in space and after that there's almost no science uh, involved you know in star wars or star trek or whatever it is it's still star travel and cosmic travel that just uh, uh it just captures our imaginations and and i, I, I you know oh i was gonna say that uh, one of the things about star wars if you remember in the first star wars movie we see Luke Skywalker on his home planet Tatooine, and there are two suns in the sky instead of just one sun setting. People say, what an imagination George Lucas has, because that couldn't happen in real life that you have two suns. So just a couple of years ago, we discovered a planet orbiting two suns that would look exactly like that scene on Tatooine. So sometimes science fiction is ahead of I science. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And, and you know, just the beauty uh, and the wonderment of it, I thought in Stanley Kubrick's, uh, you know, cinematic portrayal of 2001, which is a, the book originally, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it was that I remember just being so fascinated by that. It just seems so, it seems so real. It seems so authentic, you know. Um, Me too. And I, he made, he made a special effort uh, in the movie 2001 to make everything as science and engineering realistic as he could. And the movie still holds up very well. It's, I it's agree. a movie about the long-term evolution of humanity and what's out there waiting for us, but it's, it's beautifully done. Uh, so again, it is this weekend and, and what time does it happen? October right. 14th. So, so if you're in the San Francisco area, uh, the the um, eclipse begins about 8.05. In the morning. The biggest bite in the morning, sorry, at 8.05 a.m. The biggest bite is taken at 9.20 a.m. And then the whole thing is over at 10.42 a.m. So you can see that's a long time, 8 to 10.42. Nobody's going to be watching it the whole time. And there's no reason. The moon very slowly moves across the sun, taking a bigger, bigger bite. So my advice is go on around 9.05 or something, 9.10. <laughs> take your, you know, take your kids and your colander with you on Saturday morning and find the sun. The sun will still be a little bit low in the east. So find a position where you can see the sun and either use these safe glasses or your colander or some other projection um, to take a look at the eclipse sun and 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 uh, enjoy it for a few minutes and then go back and resume your earthly life. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, by the way, uh, for our Southern California listeners and viewers, it's roughly the same time period, correct? Right. And okay. let me just say, if you're not in California, there's a wonderful website called Time and Date. Time and Date is the website, just one word, Time and Date. And then look for their eclipse section, and you can put in any eclipse. So put in the October 14th eclipse into Time and Date, and put in your town, and it will tell you in local time what's happening, when it's happening, how much of the sun will be covered. So I really recommend time and date as the website to check out if you want to know what it's going to be like. Time and date. Uh, come visit us again. I'm glad you could be here. On There it is. Time and date. <laughs> yeah. um, you're, you're, find you're, solar I, and lunar eclipses in your city. Yeah. Always good information from you, sir. Thank you so much. It's great to have you in the mix. And I know it was, uh, you didn't realize it was our one year anniversary. I appreciate you kind of parachuting in to tell us about this this celestial event, which I think is, it's important for people to know. Kim, did you have something for the professor? Is that, uh... I did. Uh, did we mention his book? Oh, please. No, I did not mention it. Go ahead. Because you have a new children's book. Can you tell us a little bit about it before we say oh, goodbye? Thank you for asking. So we've written a children's book called When the Sun Goes Dark. You can get it on Amazon and uh, look for it on the web. And it explains with pictures and with little experiments you can do at home, 
what eclipses are all about at the at the sort of fourth fifth grade level so if if you have kids or grandkids who want to know what's happening and why eclipses are exciting to astronomers it's called when the sun goes dark oh by cool Andrew I, have, <laughs> I have a fourth grader who wants to be an astronomer that's his All current. Right. That's that's his dream. When so right now, so that's a perfect book for him. When the sun goes oh. dark. Thank you. Oh, thank you. There yeah. it is. And your your fourth fourth grader will and I will mm -hmm. need to talk. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> and you'll talk to our audience again soon. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Fracknoy. Appreciate it, Doctor Andrew Fracknoy. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.